Hello and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on innovation in public health, where we will discuss approaches to innovation, as well as share an example of a collaborative planning tool that is increasing equity and community engagement in Garrett County, Maryland. This webinar will help you think about how to overcome barriers in innovation in public health and share a new approach to community health improvement planning. So I want to acknowledge that the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps program is based at the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute, and it's a collaboration with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So my name is Justin Rivas, and I'm a community coach. And today I'm joined by a great team of colleagues. I'm going to ask them to turn their cameras on so we can all say hi, and you can see that we are indeed real people. Um, so let's, uh, let's welcome Karen Odegaard, a fellow community coach here in Madison, Wisconsin. Hello. Hey, Karen. And uh, Shelly Argebright, the strategic health planner for Garrett County Health Department. Hello. Hey, Shelly. And Jessica Solomon Fisher, the chief innovations officer at the Public Health National Center for Innovations. Hi, Justin. Hey there. And also Erica Burroughs Girardi, another community coach and regular webinar hostess will be uh, helping out behind the scenes with chats and questions. So just a heads up if you see her name popping up. Hello everyone. Hey Erica. Okay, camera's off, we're good. All right little technical difficulties on my end. Um, great, so Karen, um, you've joined us uh, here and she's gonna take us through uh, just a bit, bit of the audience engagement component of the Zoom. I am, and I'm not seeing the slide, so I'm not sure if other folks are, if we're sharing your screen right now. Oh, well, let me work on that. So while Justin pulls that up, I'll just note that um, if you joined us a few minutes early, then you, you saw a lot of this in a video introduction. But for those of you who are just joining us, we want to make sure that you um, get a, a quick sense, a quick overview on how, on how you can participate in this webinar. So if you have questions for our panelists, you can simply click the Q&A control. So you can see that highlighted here. When you do, the Q&A box will open up and you can type in your question. Then just click send to submit your question and your questions are, we welcome them at any time. So please send them in as we go. If you want to share an idea with all of the attendees or use the chat to make comments or respond to questions that we may ask you during the webinar, um, then we can use the chat feature. So to use that feature, click on the chat control the chat box will open up when you do that. And you can type in your comment. Then you can press enter to submit your response. And you'll have the option here to chat with all attendees or with the panelists only. And we ask that if you're comfortable to please chat with all attendees so that the other participants can see the ideas that you are sharing with everyone. So that's it on audience participation. Great, Karen, thanks so much. Um, so now that you're oriented to how to be an active participant on today's webinar, let's turn to what you can get out of the webinar. Uh, so here are our learning outcomes for today. First, we'll get grounded in health equity and community engagement with our resources. Next, we'll hear from Jessica on what public health innovation can look like and how to go about it. Then Shelley will walk us through Garrett County's experience with innovation. And Shelly will also share some other community examples of innovative public health practices from uh, around the country. And lastly, we'll share multiple resources uh, for your next steps towards innovative public health practices. And I also wanna share that there'll be an opportunity to deepen the learning in an interactive discussion group today, right after the webinar at 3 p.m. Central Time. Both Shelly and Jessica will join to have an open conversation about any of these learning outcomes and any other topics or questions that may arise during today's webinar. There'll be more details on how to connect to that discussion group via Zoom uh, later on in the hour. So here at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, we use data, evidence, guidance, and stories to focus attention on what drives health and equity in communities with the goal of shifting how we think about what and who causes or creates the conditions around health and equity. But what exactly do we mean by equity? I think it helps to think of what an equitable community looks like and then what it would take to achieve this. So let's paint a picture. 
Imagine a place where everyone has a fair and just chance to lead the healthiest life possible. Communities with high quality schools, good paying jobs, access to healthy foods and quality health care, and affordable housing and safe environments. Imagine a place where differences in race, gender, class, culture, and perspectives are not only tolerated, but are celebrated as fundamental to health and well-being. Imagine that this is how we all experience our communities, regardless of where we live, the circumstances we were born into, or how we look. This is the vision of health equity. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Achieving health equity means reducing and ultimately eliminating unjust and avoidable differences in health and in the conditions and resources needed for optimal health by improving the health of marginalized groups, not by worsening the health of others. Our progress towards health equity will be measured by how well uh, health disparities change over time. And this can be done by removing obstacles to health, such as poverty and discrimination and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments and healthcare. So we just dove into kind of the what of what equity is, but why, why should we focus on equity? This graphic helps us understand why equality isn't enough to close gaps. It's called one size does not fit all. And if the same resources are, or opportunities are made available to all, this will not achieve equity. Uh, from the top portion of the graphic, uh, the same adult bike is provided to all different types of people, and it does not allow everyone to ride safely, and some cannot even ride it at all, thus losing out on access to exercise and also a form of transportation. The fact that our country and communities are not made up of, quote, the same people, right, but are in fact ever more diverse is a growing reality day by day. And there is a connection between place and race, such as residential, residential racial segregation, that further the gaps in opportunities. Importantly, closing gaps to improving equity is achievable. And given we make the needed social and economic commitment, this can be done. Right? So that goes kind of to the how. Well, we know that the historic and current policies and pr practices that have caused the gaps that we see in communities um, are unfortunate, but we know that their solutions also lie in the policies and programs that can close these gaps in opportunity. So let's continue with the concept of how and refresh on how the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps program works to support communities to improve health and equity. We seek to bring people together to look at the many factors that in influence health and help them select strategies that can improve health for all and close these gaps and ultimately make changes that will have a lasting impact. We do this by providing data, evidence, guidance, and guidance for communities. We also work to gather and share stories of communities around the country that are at different points on this journey to serve as examples and inspiration, just as we're doing today. But how do, we, how do these supports connect to really achieving change? For this, we can turn to the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps Theory of Change. And this picture shows us the thinking behind how population-based data can be a catalyst for action that improves health and increases equity. So let's walk through this. We start with population-based data from a variety of sources. Then we use the data to rank the health of nearly every county in every state. And ranks, it turns out, are great for garnering attention. And each year, the rankings generates national, regional, and local media attention. Data also provides an opportunity for people to tell the story of the many factors affecting health in their community, what's going well, and where there's opportunity to make things better. And this year, we have multiple factors with disaggregated data to help communities explore and see these gaps as well. Then community members can start to identify evidence-informed strategies that can eventually be implemented to make change. And over time, these strategies, be them policies or programs, can result in longer and higher quality lives for everyone in the community. And ultimately, the rankings data is a call to action. You can use specific measures and disaggregated measures to start and continue these conversations about health and equity. So the image you see here is our rankings model, and this helps us understand what drives health in a community. One of the goals we've had with this image is to help change the conversation about health and what influences health. What this image shows us is that health is more than what happens at the doctor's office. In fact, a wide range of factors influence how long and how well we live. It includes things we often think about when we hear the word health, like healthcare or how well we eat or how much exercise we get. But we know it also th includes things like education and income, the quality of our housing and the safety of our neighborhoods. So let's now look at some of the specific measures in this model that make up the light blue health factor areas on the right side. So I wanted to share the measures in this model that you can now explore breakdowns by race in 
uh, and you'll see a screenshot on the, on the right side here. And this is of actually my home county uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And one of the measures is children in poverty that we can see this desegregation of data in. Uh, and you'll notice that by the underlined blue um, figure across from the measure, meaning you can click on it, it's hyperlinked, and it'll drop down this menu of uh, what children in poverty looks like across uh, the county. And here you'll see that um, it's uh, quite startling to see that basically if you're African-American in Milwaukee County, um, you're twice as likely to be living in poverty uh, when compared to the average across the counties and uh, almost five times as likely when compared to whites. So now we're going to uh, use uh, a couple opportunities for audience engagement. And first, I'd like for you all to use that raise your hand tool if you already knew about uh, these measures and the racial breakdown that you can uh, search these measures by. So Justin, I just wanted to remind folks that they'll find that uh, raise their hand feature at the bottom of their screen with their um, audience control panel. And you can just click it if you want to raise your hand and you guys don't have to worry about lowering it. Um, we'll take care of that for you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, and folks are continuing to raise their hands. And it looks like about 65, 70, 75 of you um, have seen this before, which is maybe about one fifth of you on the webinar right now. Um, so it's probably some new, new news to new folks. So I think that kind of leads to the next question I had uh, set up here, which is we're going to launch a poll and, and just let you guys kind of vote on uh, which of these 10 measures is most useful for you or would be more, most useful for you in your current or future community health work. So just go ahead and uh, you can click on more than one option and uh, uh, take a look at, and you'll see these fall across different, different health uh, factor areas, if you will, from health behaviors to social and economic factors uh, and physical environment. So it looks like from the preliminary results I'm seeing on the polling that children in poverty is one that seems um, quite relevant. And I think that's great because we really think of it as somewhat of a barometer for social and economic factors overall. Um, looks like the prema premature death measure is uh, definitely uh, important and preventable hospital ho hospitalizations. Um, median household income, another good measure for um, economic options. Yep, so I'm gonna stop the, stop the share, and, I'm sorry, I stop the poll and I'll share the results and you should be able to see here that um, children in poverty came in at the highest. Um, and again, household income, hospitalizations, uh, premature death was leading to. Great. Well, hopefully um, this alerted you to maybe a new feature in your own snapshot so you can search all this data locally uh, and also um, something you can share uh, in your community to start looking at some of these gaps we're discussing. So in line with one of our mantras here at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, let's move from this thought of data and move from data to action. Uh, the Action Center, which you'll find under Take Action to Improve Health on our website, provides step-by-step -step guidance and tools to help you move with data to action. Each action step is broken down into key activities with guidance and suggested tools to support your work. I like to think of the Action Center as a destination, really. You can click into the guide that seems most useful, review the related key activities, and choose the one that resonates with you at the time in your work. Related to today's webinar, you might look into activities in step one, which is assessing needs and resources, step two, focusing on what's important, and also the communicate box on the bottom right uh, when thinking about community engagement as a topic. You could also explore the work together as the box on the lower left uh, for, for searching for some equity related tools and resources um, related to our discussion as well. The most important thing to remember is that although this is a destination page at the Action Center. It's meant to be a just-in-time resource that you can revisit to find the right resources you need at the time you need them. And indeed, part of taking action can include innovation. So let's kind of pivot here uh, to Jessica and hear more on the subject and practice of innovation. So Jessica, uh, tell us a bit about PHNCI and what innovation in public health really means to public health, including why it's important. 
Happy to. Thanks so much. The Public Health National Center for Innovations, or PHNCI, is a division of the Public Health Accreditation Board. We launched in November 2015 to identify, implement, and spread innovations in public health. So in a way, we see ourselves as kind of the R&D side for FAB. What we're learning then will feed back into FAB's standards and measures. We see ourselves also as the national headquarters to really empower health departments to drive change and improve health. We do that by being a learning lab for health department innovations, developing and sharing resources, tools, education, expertise, connecting innovators both within public health and across sectors, and monitoring, disseminating, and building the science behind public health innovation. On the next slide, you'll see uh, what we mean when we talk about public health innovation. Innovation has really become a bit of a buzzword, and so we sought to give it much more meaning. We held a think tank, which is a common uh, FAB and PHNCI process, where we brought together experts from the innovation field, as well as experts in public health practice, to really define what innovation and public health means. And you can see the definition here on your screen. Along with that definition, we feel that there are a number of characteristics that need to be in place in order to support this. Those are that, the, that what you're working on, that new process, policy, product, or program, be novel, new, and creative, reflect the dynamic state of change that's inherent in public health transformation. So that notion of incremental innovation as well as that transformational innovation needs to occur by internal or cross-sector collaboration needs to involve the co-production of that process policy product or program with partner stakeholders and most importantly for us, our community. Having the potential to generate new or improved means to create value. Lending itself to adaptation, adoption, replication, and diffusion. Generating real-time information for evaluation and course correction. And if related to technology, being open source so that it's widely available. And we really see this as a draft definition that we've been working to learn more about and refine as we've been working with nine grantees over the course of the past year and a half that you'll hear a little bit more about in a few minutes. If you go to the next slide, you might be wondering, why is all of this necessary? Um, and I think that everybody who's listening in on this call knows that public health practice is in a state of change, seemingly all the time. There are new and emerging drivers that influence our focus as we do our best to respond to community needs. I won't walk through this entire graphic, but I think it just goes to show you, if you look over the past 10 and even more recent five years, all of the things that are kind of being thrown at public health practice and this just represents a few of them, um, but, not, but not all of them, but it does paint a picture of the factors that inform how and why we may need to innovate to best serve our communities. Great, Jessica. There's, there's a lot there, and I really like the concept of uh, that kind of incremental uh, shift towards innovation. It doesn't have to all be such large scale and groundbreaking. Um, just a question, so what is needed to support innovation in public health practice? It's a great question. And some of what's needed is that which is the hardest to find, and that's time and space. So literally having the time available to, to think about these things and to understand how to best respond. That leadership support is crucial. Um, having an openness to new ideas, having your community or customer engaged is a key tenant to uh, successful innovation. That notion of creativity that I always or that I mentioned earlier and then a process and a purpose. So we would say don't innovate for the sake of innovation. That's not going to get you anywhere. Um, but it is important to follow a process uh, when it is appropriate to innovate. And you can see one of those processes here on your screen. This graphic represents the design thinking process, which is one of the most common processes uh, we find in innovation. And this just depicts the three kind of main main phases that inspire, ideate, and implement. And then behind those phases are these uh, steps depicted here. So design thinking, it's one of the more common processes you'll hear about. And it's really used to, to solve complex problems for which there is not an existing process, product, program, or policy. But a key here is that it also takes the emotional state of the end user into account. And that's that notion of working with the community, of producing something with the community, not for the community. Um, and you'll hear from Garrett County Health Department in just a few minutes, um, and they're using the innovation process to do that transformational kind of higher level innovation through what might be seen as an incremental um, innovation, a, a process, a tool, um, but using that to really transform practice in their community. And so you can do it at a small scale and you can do it at a large scale. 
Great. Thanks, Jessica. And that image is, is really helpful for me because I'm a visual person. And, and if some folks listening are too, we, we will be sharing all the slides uh, as we usually do. So you'll have these uh, images uh, available to you and, and also a nice resource guide uh, to come, go along with it. So moving on, uh, what then is PHNCI doing to support innovation in public health? Sure. So as you saw, we defined it, which we think is a key first step to make sure we're all on the same page and know what we're all talking about. Uh, we have stories, blogs, tools, resources, et cetera, to help health departments understand innovation, both what it is and how to do it. And one of our larger bodies of work is in directly supporting grantees with both funding and a learning community. So we currently have um, our first cohort of innovation learning community grantees. There are nine of them, um, and they're working on a whole variety of different categories of work from participatory budgeting in Tacoma Pierce County, Washington, to health and all policies across sectors at the state level in Colorado, institutionalizing health equity at the agency level, at the local level in Minnesota, reducing recidivism for those with mental health issues in DuPage County, Illinois, and then of course in Garrett County, what we're here to learn more about today. Um, and what all of our grantees have in common, despite them working on um, very different bodies of work, is they all have this underlying theme of both equity and community engagement. And I think it's those two things that were of most interest nationally to the Garrett County Health Department work. And there was so much interest in um, what Shelly and her team are doing, um, hundreds of people actually contacting Garrett County to say, what is this tool? How can we do it? That we sought to work with them through our first replication cycle, which as I mentioned earlier is, is, is key when you're looking at innovation and diffusing that innovation. And because of that national interest, because of the fantastic work that they were doing, uh, we sought to work with them to develop a pilot and really uh, learn how to replicate their work and what that might look like. And so I'm really excited now to turn things over to Shelly so she can tell you more about the details of what's happening these days in Garrett County, Maryland. Shelly. Thanks, Jessica. It has been a joy to work with you and your team at PHNCI. Um, we're delighted to have this opportunity with everyone today to share our work with such a broad audience. And I'm hopeful that others will be inspired to innovate as they hear a little bit more about what we've been doing here in Western Maryland. This work started at the local health department in the fall of 2016. And at that time, my team and I didn't anticipate in those early stages that the effort our community put forth on this digital platform would be replicated so quickly in communities across the nation. It's been really exciting for us and I wanna give a shout out to everyone here in Garrett County who has embraced this planning tool and who are helping to promote the change that's needed through the transparency that it provides. I'd also like to thank the Public Health Accreditation Board, the National Network of Public Health Institutes, All In, and venues like FIT and the Open Forum, and of course, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's collaborative relationships like these and the support from PHNCI that have made the replication of this innovation possible. The next slide. So, um, to tell you a little bit more about the work, uh, we've built a digital collaborative that we call the Garrett County Planning Tool, and it can be found at mygarrettcounty.com. It enables communities to create a shared vision that's based upon data to meaningfully engage residents. In our rural Appalachian community, equity has increased dramatically because we've simply created a space for conversations to begin and continue about what matters most to people. It's here in this space that we are able to harness the local knowledge and the energy of our community members. We invite anyone to our table. The opportunity exists to be a part of this planning and ultimately the decisions that we make as a community to improve health. We also created a space for hyper-local data collection in our action groups. This is a completely transparent way, transparent way that any user, that's partner agency, business or community member, sets metrics and measures the strategies with all of those interested in and who are working toward the same goals. So hyper-local data collection on our tool is simply tracking progress. Many track on a monthly basis uh, and that's in a localized framework. What's really beautiful about this is that it captures the collective impact while maintaining the integrity of those individual agencies that have put forth effort toward accomplishing the strategies that have been designed with and for the community. Wow, Shelley, this is uh, a lot of great stuff here. And, and I wanna know what is one key component to the success of the innovative approach to public health planning that you've really had? 
Thanks, Justin. That's a fabulous question. And I think there are several components that we need to highlight. Um, when we think about this, uh, there's a critical step in improving health in any community, and that's to develop pathways. We want to develop pathways for residents and partner organizations to contribute to the planning decisions that affect them. We started this webinar and you defined equity, saying that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Then you spoke about removing some obstacles. So in the simplest of terms, that's what we did here. We removed obstacles by opening up this process. We realized that not enough people in our community knew that we were working on health assessments or improvement plans, let alone that they could be a part of those plans. I truly believe that we have an opportunity working at the local level to challenge ourselves and to try new things when it comes to engaging our populations. It can be as simple as eliminating the need to attend meetings. I ask myself often, is it realistic of me as a health planner to expect a working mom to attend an 8 a.m. health improvement meeting in the middle of her work week? Most likely, she's not able to take away time from her paying job to attend. And if I didn't work at this job, I probably couldn't either. So part of our work is remembering that those of us in this field are community members too. And it helps us as we to stop expecting people to do things that we couldn't do ourselves. So, we simply improved access and we made it a lot easier for people to participate by going digital and making this process mobile friendly. Well, the Garrett County uh, planning tool seems like it does a lot more than improve access and collect data. You actually use it to create your community health improvement plan. So could you tell us just a little more about that? Sure, we wanna make sure that health improvement work is meaningful and that community solutions are accessible. So in order to do that, we need to raise awareness. I had already, like I already mentioned, we need to get more people, but we need to make sure that those additional people are empowered to actually help direct the plans. So we can have the most solid evidence-based strategies that are grounded in data, but if our community doesn't know about our plans or believe in the strategies that we've chosen, how effective do you think we're going to be? So our planning tool at mygarrettcounty.com, it does raise awareness it increases equity, and it gives people a place to have conversations about issues. But we didn't stop there. Uh, we wanna be responsive and we wanna empower our agency stakeholders and our community members to come up with their own strategies and ways to track that success. So yes, our community health improvement plan is curated from the action groups inside of our planning tool. And utilizing it has really changed the way that we work together in our county. And it's been a tremendous shift. Definitely a tremendous shift and, and something that seems really unique. Um, and before we dive deeper, can you just tell us uh, about some of the national recognition that this work has received as it being that unique? Certainly, uh, it is officially recognized as an innovation in public health by the Public Health National Center for Innovations and is the first funded project from PHNCI to replicate the innovation, as Jessica mentioned. This work has recently been designated as a promising practice through the National Association of County and City Health Officials, and it's played a role in our community receiving the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Prize in 2017. So the alignment with national organizations has certainly helped to validate this work and has given our community the confidence to invest time in our process. It's not just another grant project that will disappear when funding dries up. We're building a sustainable thing. And at the same time, we wanna make sure that communities everywhere have access to this tool. That's why it's an open source project. We believe equity, we believe in equity, excuse me. And it's a principle that we've carried throughout this work. Yeah, I think that that seems really evident, Shelley, and, and I think it's it definitely moves beyond the recognition and uh, just speaks to the, the credibility of the excellent work you guys have done locally uh, in just such a short time. Um, why do you think it's garnered such success otherwise? I think that it solves several problems that a lot of us run into in the field of public health. Um, we took the opportunity to survey over 100 communities last year and we found out that we were not alone in some of our struggles. Communities across the United States, in, including a few external territories, were surveyed de detailing community composition, awareness, engagement, data strategies, collections, and opportunities to improve representation. And what we found is that awareness of community improvement processes weighed in at less than 5% in most communities. 
We also found that 98% of the communities surveyed experienced difficulties with community engagement. And 61% reported gaps in information as barriers to community engagement. So this tells me that this work is difficult and the people who are trying to do it have the same issues that we were having. So the success of a platform like this rests in the fact that we're helping to solve some of those problems, we're removing obstacles, and we're measuring it. Yeah, the measurement's incredibly important. And maybe you could talk to me a little bit more about the measurement and uh, the concept of collecting this hyperlocal data. So practically, you cannot manage what you don't measure. And equity in any and community engagement uh, is largely supported by the high standards that accompany accreditation. We are so thankful for FAB. Uh, they set the bar high and they expect accredited health departments to engage in meaningful ways with our communities. Uh, when I started this work, it was largely because of those standards and thinking about assessments and health improvement plans and how to make them more meaningful. So an example is before we used the planning tool, um, just in a traditional approach, we had approximately 150 people that were involved in our community health improvement plan. That's less than one half of 1% of our entire county population. So at that point, it was pretty clear that we needed to make some changes. And we began using our innovative planning tool and we actually made it easy and affordable for our community to collaborate and track their work. And we've drastically increased awareness by going digital and we're making dramatic improvements toward that health improvement plan being more meaningful because now we have 41.7% of the people in our county uh, that are engaged, know what we're trying to do and can see who's participating. I think measurement is a key component to all of this work and that happens inside of our action groups. It's where our conversations come alive and it's where the community mobilizes around strategies. Currently we have over a hundred public groups and each side and excuse me inside each of those groups residents have the opportunity to create strategies and record their progress. In addition on our platform we can fully integrate existing dashboards uh, that communities may be using to help visualize their data. Shelly, these num numbers are kind of mind boggling for me. I mean, you said that less than half of a percent of the population was engaged in the process. And from the survey um, that you administered, uh, only 5% roughly across those communities were engaged. And then you reached almost 42%. Um, that's, that's just really fantastic. And I think that, um, I mean, to have that many people involved uh, authentically in the process. There's not that many people that uh, vote in elections in most counties. So that's, a, that's quite an achievement. Um, what else could you share? Thank you so much. Um, we feel the same. And what's most exciting about the work uh, is that this is an open source project. So communities across the nation can involve um, just regular residents and members and get their stakeholders a little more involved and bring transparency and accountability to the work um, because we all have the same goal and that's simply that we want to be living and have more opportunities we want to have better communities and um, that's done when we work together so um, this is an example of a group on mygarrettcounty.com and <clears throat> It's an action group that's comprised of about 102 different people and they represent various agencies and community stakeholders. The issue that this particular group is built around is creating a digital resource guide. So inside of the group, we're able to collect qualitative data because people work together uh, to basically improve the resource guide. They set strategies together, they define metrics, and they even plan a launch party um, inside of this group on the planning tool. We're able to collect some quantitative data because we track the success of the guide itself and it creates a tremendous sense of accountability and it gives everyone ownership of this project. Uh, and here are just a few highlights from mygarrettcounty.com. It's kind of an 18 month progress report, if you will. Um, and we went from doing this work on a very small budget to gaining $225,000 in competitive grant funding. and. Today, we have, we have over 1,900 planning partners. Uh, those are actively engaged community stakeholders. 
We have over 20,000 users. That's a total number of people that have viewed our site. And we have over 125,000 page views. So we're delighted with these results and we're incredibly thankful that we have meaningful work and um, that we can help bring solutions to people that are looking to improve community's health, community health, but we realize there's a lot more that needs to be done. So that brings us to a great transition and I'm going to hand it back over to Jessica. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear to everybody why we selected Garrett County Health Department as our first grantee to kind of work with a replication cycle on. The numbers that Shelley just shared are impressive. The authenticity of the engagement of their community is really impressive um, and they really do meet our definition of innovation and, and our supporting characteristics. So we are working with them on this pilot project where we selected five competitively, five additional health departments to pilot test the universal community planning tool in their communities. Uh, we think it was important to identify different types of communities who are at different stages and you can see them represented here. So it's Allegheny County Health Department, Maryland, Clackamas County Public Health in Oregon, Flathead City County Health Department in Montana, the Medina County Combined General Health District in Ohio, and the DC Department of Health. And they were selected not just because they had a good plan in place, but again, this really allows us to test the tool and its implementation in a variety of different settings with different geographies, different communities, demographics, from rural to urban, east coast to west coast. Um, each of these health departments had a particular interest in using the tool at this time to increase authentic community engagement, promote equity. And so our interest was also in working with Garrett County to understand what it takes to support this work in other areas. So is the tool successful because of um, Shelly and her team and all of the effort they put behind it? Certainly, but imagine that there are other contextual factors that also lead to the tool being able to be successful in other areas. And before we could take it to scale, uh, we wanted to understand what some of those factors of success might look like, what some of the barriers might be. And so a pilot test is really the first and best way to do that when you're looking at diffusing innovation. Um, we kicked off this work in July with a training where the sites came together to learn how to install, so the technical aspects, how to kind of install the universal community planning tool, um, considering what to name it even, and really beginning to build on um, their platforms. And they're going to look different than it looks in Garrett County. They're using the bones that Garrett put together, um, but contextualizing it for their own communities. So that's our description. With that, I'll turn it back to Shelley to tell you a little bit more about where each of the pilot sites are right now. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I will say that it was very difficult to choose the five communities um, through this competitive granting process because we want to give it to everyone. <laughs> um, but we're so pleased and it's been a true pleasure training them so far. Um, and what I'm, I'm most excited about in the short time that we've been working together is that the intention of the work has remained central in all five pilot sites. Um, I like to think about our innovation being replicated like you may share a favorite recipe. So we created the Universal Community Planning Tool or the UCPT in Garrett County and that's our open source recipe that anyone has access to. So MyGarrettCounty.com uses our UCPT but it has a bit of regional flair. We've used some locally sourced ingredients and we add some flavors that are unique to our Appalachian community. If you think about each of our five pilot sites, they offer the same kind of exceptional cuisine and they feature equity and they feature hyperlocal data collection. That's the UCPT, but each are adding their own flair, just as we've done in Garrett County. These five communities and those that join us in the future are going to be united by this main recipe. That's the UCPT. And when we, we want people to think of that and remember the UCPT uh, and the way that it offers community a way to increase equity and collect hyperlocal data. So as this body of work continues to grow, you'll see rep recipes popping up everywhere and they'll all look different and they may taste a little different, but rest assured they'll be built uh, upon the UCPT, which is kind of vested in equity. So let me introduce our first pilot site, that's DC. Emily and her team are building a fabulous platform and you can find it at ourhealthydc.org. In addition to empowering community stakeholders, DC's unique spin on this UCPT is the way that they're weaving in the numerous 
existing citywide plans and they're working towards strengthening collaboration in that way. And the next county is Allegheny County, Maryland. This is our neighboring county in Western Maryland. And uh, Dr. Jennifer Quarter and her team are utilizing existing partnerships through their local health improvement coalition. They're strengthening their approach toward community engagement as they being, begin inviting stakeholders to join their beautiful site at AlleghenySpeaks.com. And going a bit further west, we've got Medina County in Ohio. Krista and her team are using the UCPT to highlight transparency by opening up the process to illustrate the impact of public health in a variety of communities ranging from rural to urban. And I invite you to visit livingwellmedinacounty.com to learn more. And our fourth pilot is our largest county geographically and it's located in Flathead, Montana. Molly and Heather are committed to improving equity by utilizing their site found at flatheadforward.com. They're focused on empowering community members to build action groups that foster community resiliency. And helping us span the entire county is the pilot pilot's final pilot site we would like to introduce, Clackamas County, Oregon. So we can visit blueprintclackamas.com to see how Anna and Philip are utilizing the UCPT by connecting mini grantees as their entire community works together to improve health in Clackamas County. I'd also like to add that these pilot sites have only been working on this project since June. Uh, they're evolving and changing, most of them daily as they're actively working on, um, on the site and working toward building uh, their community launch. So I invite you to check back often and be watching for the case studies and the use cases that uh, we'll be publishing from all that we're learning in this pilot as we implement the UCPT in five very unique communities. Well, thank you so much, Shelley. Um, these are really some great examples and your enthusiasm and, and passion for this work is, is really evident just in, in how you're talking about it and explaining it uh, and the fact that you're throwing public health launch parties. I mean, that's innovative. I think that's great. Um, so in closing, do you have any advice for communities that are thinking about innovation? Uh, thanks, Justin. I think innovation is no longer an option. Uh, I would encourage everyone to be open uh, to new ideas, look for ways to improve equity in any way that you possibly can. Um, and during the few weeks that we've worked with our pilot sites, a uh, common theme that has is among them basically is flexibility. They each started out with a very firm, well thought out plan for successfully implementing this tool. Um, and they've each encountered issues and problems um, and had to some of them reframe their plans. Um, but they didn't stop. They found ways around obstacles and they've demonstrated tremendous persistence and a commitment to the intent of the project. And it's that type of attitude uh, that we all need to bring about this change in our communities. Uh, and so for us in Garrett County, we have fully embraced this concept of, of failing forward and um, finding ways around obstacles and, and partnerships and, and just new ways to do the same things. And um, I just want to invite communities everywhere not to be discouraged if you don't have large amounts of, of funding. Um, as Jessica said, you know, innovate wisely, um, but the funding will come if, if the heart is there and you're coming up with solutions to problems that everyone faces. Um, so we're, we're proud of the work and we invite, um, we're thankful and we just invite everyone to join us. Great, Shelly. Do you want to just um, tip people off to this link on the slide here and the, the website that you've created? Sure, so um, you can visit this and it basically takes you into um, a few of the different areas of our work that we wanted to highlight and um, you can learn a little bit more about the replication. Um, you can find an agency readiness checklist for communities that might be thinking about ways to innovate. Uh, it's, a, it's an easy tool to, uh, for instance, do in a coalition or uh, any type of community organizational um, meeting and then for those of you who might think you're ready and you want a tool like this, we also have an interest form um, that you can fill out and we'll be able to get back with you. So um, 
we'd love to connect and um, help you in any way that we can. Great, yeah, so we're really thankful that you kind of put this site together, it's just kind of those first steps um, and uh, helping people uh, take the first steps in this journey. So uh, next, Jessica is just gonna share a little bit more on, on innovation here and some resources. Sure, I just wanted to share our website where we are collecting stories, blogs, tools from health departments that are doing innovative work. Um, you can visit us at phnci.org. A few things to point out specifically, we do have a public health innovation playbook. Uh, we put this together in collaboration with the Alliance for Innovation, who has more than 30 years of experience working specifically on innovation and in local government. Uh, we worked with them to make the book specific to public health. So there are public health examples, the language is public health e and it should um, be more comfortable for those working in public health. And that's a free resource. I would say stay tuned for pilot site learnings. As Shelly mentioned, we're early on into working with the pilot sites. And so there's a lot left to come in terms of what they'll learn and what we'll learn from them uh, when we consider how we might take this to scale and what technical assistance might be available from PHNCI and Garrett County for those looking to implement this sort of work in their own communities. Shelly already talked about uh, the My Garrett County and Equity Engage is another great resource where a lot of the tools and resources that relate to the Universal Community Planning tool reside. So I would encourage everybody to visit that website and certainly to stay in touch. We want to know what you're interested in. We want to know what you're doing and we want to know how we can look to support you. So um, you have contact information here for myself and for Shelly and uh, please stay in touch. Great, Jessica. Um, so I just want to do another quick plug that we are having a discussion group uh, after today's webinar. Um, we're going to dive into some Q&A right now, some questions with, with the guests that Karen will facilitate, but we'll share the resources to get you into the um, discussion group as well if you want to stick around and have more of an interactive conversation. So uh, I'll let Karen take it over from here and we'll, we'll turn our cameras back on to uh, make this uh, Q&A uh, you know, a bit more personal, if you will. So go ahead, Karen, take it away. All right, great. <clears throat> well, um, I want to say thank you to Shelly and Jessica for sharing this rich resource and information. We've got a lot of great questions coming in. Um, I want to start with one that I'm, I'm kind of uh, combining a, a number of questions. Lots of people are wondering, Shelly, about how did you engage people who may not have internet access or may not, you know, be as um, confident online? How did you make sure that those folks could be included as part of this work as well? So that's a great question, and uh, it's certainly something that we continue to uh, look at and try to find ways to, to do a better job at. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we did early on was we connected with our uh, community service type of agencies. So we went to the library, uh, we went to community action, and we went to places that have direct client interaction. Uh, taught them about the tool, uh, gave them cards and resources, uh, and actually in incentivized uh, those frontline community members uh, working in those positions uh, to help uh, their clients basically get on. Um, we also use Facebook logins, and um, we found that some of our most vulnerable residents do have um, Facebook, and so we were able to basically connect uh, with people that we weren't thinking we would be able to early on uh, in those types of ways. That's, that's great. Um, there we go. I couldn't remember if I muted, then I did, then I, you know, anyway, um, technology. So, um, Another question that we're seeing coming in in a lot of different forms, and you kind of started to touch on it just by answering that question, Shelley, but how'd you get the word out? So you worked with some other agencies, you used Facebook, how else did you get the word out to let people know that this was a way that they could get engaged with you? I think we have to back up a little bit because we started the process uh, out of our needs assessment. Uh, we had just started in our community um, thinking about using technology and kind of going digital with some of our processes. And so we used Facebook and we started trying to do a little bit more on social media um, with that assessment. And we started our planning tool out with a forum and just asked people's feedback. Um, and so 
it wasn't difficult for our community to respond. They were ready and had been waiting, I think, for an opportunity to participate. And um, we also started with uh, like a soft launch. Uh, we basically used our internal staff and our stakeholders and other agencies, let them know that the tool was existing. Um, and so it was a combination for us. And um, I think that it just depends on your community, um, what your community is used to, and um, if your community is ready for um, this type of communication. Mm -hmm. You know, I think <clears throat> um, one of the other things that this is raising for people, we are seeing a number of questions about, so once you get it going, what is the staff support needed to moderate it, to make sure that it keeps flowing, that it's, it's useful? Sure. Um, that's another great question. And uh, it's one that we get often. And um, we have a team of two. Um, so I think that there's just, when you have the right community makeup and you launch the tool, uh, the idea is that you're empowering others. So you empower your agency stakeholders, you empower your community, and the tool organically grows and it takes a life of its own, really. Um, and so I'm not sitting in my office creating groups and I'm not moderating this in my silo. Um, it's really a community project. And um, people often ask us kind of in lines with that question, well, what about if people put something that you don't like up or it's inappropriate? Um, and there are ways that we have things built into the back of the site to help with moderation. Um, but honestly, um, in our community, we've only had to take down one comment and that was a largely political comment. And it was a phone call of me saying, you know, explaining that conversation, having a quick conversation and then that person being like, oh, I didn't even realize that. So that's one of the things that we're certainly testing and we're interested to see um, how it works in these other communities that we're piloting the work in. Uh, but for us, uh, we do it with two and um, mm -hmm. It really hasn't it really hasn't been that difficult that's good that's great and I think that's really helpful for communities to hear who maybe don't feel like they have a whole team of tech people that they can put on um, sure. something like this um, so a couple of questions um, about if this tool is intended to replace in-person meetings or have you seen it be become a bridge that maybe helps people engage in real life um, in a different way so I am so, Jessica just unmuted, so I want to make sure that we can turn to Jessica as well. Here. Yeah, I just actually, I think it's a question for Shelly, but before she answers, I do just want to remind everybody, uh, because I think these are really great questions and they're important questions. And as Shelly said, they're, um, they're questions that she gets a lot. Um, but this is a tool for a community health improvement planning process. And so when we think about the staff time that goes into supporting the tool to, um, you know, chatting in the groups to posting things online to the moderation i think that's that's part of staff time and there's a technical capacity there that's needed that's relatively minimal and there's the staff time to moderate the tool but i just want to remind everybody that this is part of the larger community health improvement planning process that health departments in particular um, hospital systems and others hopefully already have staff time devoted to. And so just to put it in that context, um, when we think about how we're answering some of these questions, it's not just about the tool, it's about the entire process. And so um, be listening for that, everybody, when you're listening to how Shelly's answering the questions. I think it's important. That's a great point, Jessica. Thanks for chiming in with that. I'll turn back to Shelly um, and see if you have any anything to add to that piece. And then also talking about how does this integrate with in-person meetings and groups? Sure. Thank you for unmuting yourself, Jessica. Um, it's a very important point that she did make. And my role here at the local health department is a health planner. So I do, um, I am responsible for the assessments and the improvement plans. And um, I'm also the accreditation coordinator. So very much is in alignment with my current job duties. It's just this tool has helped me um, to do my job better. Um, and so when we think about meetings, I know I spoke a little bit about that when we talked about the larger community. And um, meetings are an unfortunate part of our lives, and we have many of them. Um, but I think that it does certainly does not take the place of, and if anything, it does build that bridge that you, you spoke of, Karen, because um, many of the groups that are on the planning tool 
uh, are already existing coalitions. And it's a place where they can communicate in between meetings, they can share documents, they can track some of their strategies and their successes and um, actually create more um, momentum in the community by letting people know what they do. And let's say you're a teacher, you really are interested in the Cancer Coalition, but obviously you can't get there during the day. So how can you add in and you can read their minutes and you can talk about what's happening um, inside of the group. So it's been a tremendous way to um, strengthen the coalition as it is and then for uh, agency stakeholders to reach outside and gain community engagement. Great. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more. Is that true? Justin, I'm going to look for a nod. Yeah, that sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Um, so I want to give you a chance to, to kind of go back to some of the small wins or, or big wins that have come out of this in your community. And, um, and I think to Jessica's point, to tie it back to how has this impacted your community's ability to assess and improve health in the community? Um, that's a great one. And um, I think that it's difficult for me to pinpoint one. Um, certainly the way that we've been able to um, expand and gain this awareness. So going from the 150 people that were part of this process before to now almost half um, is incredible. And the fact that people care about health planning in general, what's health planning? <laughs> um, and when we break it down and we talk about, well, actually health planning is food insecurity. And so then uh, you're able to have these conversations and people are saying, oh, I know about this backpack program. Um, and my children, you know, has a friend that has a backpack and we want to donate to that. And so when people start breaking down uh, what really does affect them and what matters to them and their lives and their neighbors lives, I think it becomes much more real. And we talk a lot, we talked a lot about creating that meaning. And um, that's where it's so important to collect the hyper-local data um, around those certain strategies. And people can see the differences that are being made and they can, they can be a part of it. So um, it's really difficult for me to, to say it's one thing or the other. Um, it is this huge process and it's, um, I think it's really about empowering everyone to understand that they have a piece of that and where do they fit? Uh, and how can they be part of this community? Um, so I hope that answers your question. That was really helpful, I think, uh, Shelley and Jessica, and I want to continue this conversation in, in the discussion group. So I'm just going to move back to the slides really quickly, and hopefully I can do that a little more successfully this time. Uh, and then uh, just folks, let you let you know that um, if you do have uh, cameras, um, we're going to go back to that kind of setup in the discussion group, and you can uh, hopefully be able to engage uh, in the same format with us, just like that. Um, so I just wanted to um, uh, just remind everyone that uh, if you're new to the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation's Culture of Health Prize. Uh, this is an opportunity and the 2019 call for applications is open uh, right now and it recognizes communities that have placed a priority on health and are creating powerful partnerships and deep commitments that will enable everyone, uh, especially those facing these barriers to good health that we talked about today, uh, really thrive. Um, to learn more about prize eligibility criteria and the selection process uh, and key dates, you can go to rwjf.org slash prize. And uh, you can also find some links to past prize winner videos, which are really inspirational, including uh, Garrett County. Uh, in relation to that, some upcoming webinars, we do have the 2019 RWJF Cultural Prize webinar um, that's just basically going to walk through uh, that application process. If you need some more details, uh, it's really helpful, I think. And then in October, we'll have our County Health Rankings 101 web webinar, which is um, got some new content and just providing uh, some background on the program and, and the data and the evidence and the community stories we provide. Uh, so if you're interested in discussion group, we'd love for you to join us. Uh, and what uh, it's going to involve is basically um, clicking on a Zoom link. And we're going to launch a poll right now. I know we're one minute over, but these are some of the topics. If uh, you think you'd be interested in discussion group that we're going to cover, as well as anything that you want to bring into the discussion group um, and share with us. And again, it's going to be just that a discussion group, a way to interact uh, and engage. So um, please respond to this poll. It's like we have uh, a lot of interest across, well, 
almost equally across most of these. But yeah, um, the first steps towards innovation and getting started with the UCPT look like they're of interest. So I welcome um, you folks that are responding uh, to please, um, well, stay connected with us and thank you, but also to, um, I'm rushing through, I know, to get to uh, this URL here and we can jump on the discussion group right now and continue the conversation and we'll have a special guest facilitating for us. So hopefully I'll see a lot of you there. Uh, thank you very much and have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you on another webinar sometime soon.